All right. How's everyone tonight? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to remind everyone, we're, we will be having a uh, little meeting on the 20th. And I want to invite everyone. Uh, Brother Jacob and David Lister will be talking about the gospel and prophecy. We'll be talking about Babylon and the need for discipleship. And that's an important topic to remember, getting out of Babylon. Getting out of Babylon. Spiritually speaking, what would be the world? Coming out of the world and into Christ. And, of course, in the need for discipleship and evangelism, and we'll address those things. Um, they go together, by the way. Prophecy and the gospel, they go together. Jesus said it, they go together. He talks about the last days. He says, go and preach the gospel uh, to all nations. And then, he says, then the end will come. So the needing to preach the gospel is connected to the coming of Jesus. And uh, most people just think, yeah, Jesus is going to come whenever he's going to come. That is true. He's going to come. But, you know, it, it's related to the church's fulfilling the Great Commission, and we forget that. Even Peter says that you can hasten the day of his coming by evangelizing and discipleship. And I guess the question would be, how can you hasten something that God already knows is going to happen? It's called the paradox, right? We talked about paradox. We talked about it at Margie's house for like an hour just on that, just on that subject alone, the uh, um, you know, predestination, free will, the paradox that exists outside of time and how we have to think about it in those terms. But we have to hold those things together. And uh, if you do feel a tension in that, that is, that is good. There is, has to be a tension. Uh, a tension holds things together. I was helping my son put a, uh, a goal. Uh, well, he plays soccer, so we put a goal post together, the goalie. And uh, it, it works by tension. It works by pulling something, holding it, putting it on another pole, and, and you have springs, and you have a uh, um, sort of this resistant band, and all works by tension. And if there's no tension, it wouldn't work. And so in the Christian life, we hold things in tension like this. How can God know something that he knows in eternity, but yet for us, we have to do something in order to hasten it, making it come quicker. Well, to a person who doesn't think about it, they just think that's a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction. It's, it's called a paradox. Both things are true at the same time. In our minds, we think, oh, contradiction. It doesn't work. Um, but it does work. In fact, your batteries work that way, right? This remote works because there's a negative and a positive. It seems contradictory, but if they work together, it actually makes the remote work better. So anyway, so that's May 20th. And if you come, we'll feed you. There's lunch provided, so uh, that gets everybody excited too. I don't know what they're planning on having for lunch, so don't ask me. I have no idea. It's a, it's a mystery surprise, not kind of all those surprise dinners that mom used to make, but, you know, uh, it will be a surprise. But on that day, and then on the 21st, uh, on Sunday, we'll be back again talking about the gospel and prophecy. I think the message on Sunday is Christ the foundation, so don't miss that one, May 21st. But on the 20th, we'll be talking about the gospel and prophecy. So tonight, uh, we're going to finish off the tale of two cities, the tale of two cities, which way is humanity going to go, Babylon or Jerusalem, Babylon or Jerusalem. And we always remind each other, right? This is a reminder for everyone in the church. Everything written in the scripture speaks about Christ. Everything written in scripture speaks about Christ. He told us that on the road to Emmaus, so the two disciples and our famous saying, no scripture, no Christ, no Christ, no scripture. If you had no scripture and you had Christ, it would just be somebody who just came. But there would be no announcement of what he would do or who he was. But if you had, uh, if you had scripture and no Christ, then you just have empty promises. But no one really to fulfill them. So Jesus and the word are intricately connected together. He is the word incarnate. Our Bible is the word in print. He is the word in the flesh. Our Bible is the Word in black and white, and He's the Word made flesh. And so when you think of the Bible, think of Christ. When we think of how we relate to Christ, think how we relate to Scripture. So, Tell of Two Cities, right? It's not the one Charles Dickens wrote. It was a great book if you want to read it. Uh, but he spoke of Paris and London right around the French Revolution. We are going to be speaking about Babylon, which has its ultimate meaning in Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, 18. And, of course, at, that began way back in Genesis, didn't it, with the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. And ultimately, it will end in Babylon. Same things that happened in the Tower of Babel reoccur at the end of the age, 
But now the city is called Babylon. The city is called Babylon. And by the way, it is true. Somebody asked me, uh, the word Babel in Genesis, it is the same word of Babylon. It is translated differently in our Bibles, just the way our English happened to be. But when Daniel goes to Babylon, the word is Babel, same as Genesis 11. So it would have connected those two stories, Daniel and the Tower of Babel. And of course, we speak of Jerusalem, not just the earthly Jerusalem, but the ultimate meaning of Jerusalem is the new Jerusalem, which comes down as a bride made ready for her husband, which again, a paradox. Oh, we found another paradox. Is it a city or is it a bride? It's both, isn't it? It's a paradox. Well, how can it be both a city and a, and, and a, and a person? It's because God's people, the bride, live in the city, and God is in the midst of her. God is in the midst of us today. He lives in us, and in that city, he will be not only in us, but through us in terms of who God really is. He's transcendent, so he will be among us, in us, and through us, if you can understand that. And the bride will be there. The people of God will be there in a city. And so as we read through, you know, kind of like a journey through the Bible, we're, we're going through a journey of the Bible, just, you know, put on your safety belt and, and you go through the Bible, you find the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures, of course, the New Covenant and the New Testament, but they all lead to one place, the New Jerusalem. But the study begins, and then uh, I, I guess most of the churches, make, we make this mistake, the study we, we think of begins in the New Testament. You know, it's just like, well, the Bible doesn't begin in the New Testament. The Bible begins in the Old Testament. We cut right through the end, right? Do we want to get John to John 3.16? We just want to get there, and it doesn't matter what Amos said or Hosea said or any of the prophets said. We just want to get to John 3.16. And um, the church has been very guilty of that, just bypassing everything, because you bypass a great deal of history, a great deal of how the New Testament is put together. In fact, this is the purpose of the Tale of Two Cities study, part five, which will be our final one, is to show you that from beginning to end, God is the same, but he deals with this one major subject in the Bible, which a lot of people try to put off, Israel. What about Israel? And what about Jerusalem? And what about the future of Jerusalem? And we forget that this city and our destiny is bound together. The city of Jerusalem, the future of Jerusalem, our future is bound together inexplicably. And I don't have to tell you that. Paul the Apostle told us that. In Romans 9 to 11, we're bound together with Israel. The purposes of God for Israel are the same or will ultimately be together with the purposes of God for the church. So as God is saving you, God also wants to save Israel. And he will save Israel. We'll see that at the end. But we, last time we looked at, we looked at, of course, the wonders of Jerusalem. And we can't think of Jerusalem without thinking of David, right? The city of David, the city of the great king, Jerusalem. It wasn't speaking of David, but was speaking of God. And, of course, his son, Solomon, uh, what they did is that they took the tabernacle, which had been in Shiloh for a while, where God's presence was, and God had ordered them to build a temple. David wanted to build it, but it was Solomon who got to build it. And it was a magnificent temple, Temple of Solomon. You can read all about it in the book of Kings. And uh, we read a little bit of that last time. And how God's presence was there. In fact, the, the priests twice couldn't even minister in the temple because the glory of God came. And it was so heavy, the priests were scared. They're so scared of God because when God shows up, you know, it's, and then you're not right with God. It's a scary thing to be, isn't it? We talked about that last time too. God, you know, it's, it's a hazardous occupation to meet with God if you're not right. And in the Old Testament, that proved to be true. Many of the priests... But, of course, Solomon entered into unholy alliances, didn't he? And he sinned. He sinned very heavily against the Lord. His wives turned his heart away from God, and he built pagan temples all over, uh, well, in Jerusalem, including inside the temple. It's a horrible experience, and you could read about that. And, uh, and it split the nation. In fact, the nation went into idolatry because uh, Solomon's idolatry himself the seeds were sown. Yeah, this is up in the northern Israel. This is, this is Dan, the tribe of Dan, built temples to the golden calf. We could see them. I've been there. You, you could see them. You can walk right up to where the, the priest would have been worshiping the golden calves uh, up in the northern part of Israel. And they call the golden calves, they even call them God. They even call them Yahweh. Uh, how far can somebody go? Well, I think we don't have to look too far today where people mention the name of God and they say God is trans. 
just a church uh, this week. God is trans. God is gay. God is this. God. How can they be speaking of the same God? Well, it started way back then. They would name the name of God, but attribute it to some foreign deity, to some foreign God. And, of course, the seeds of the vision were there, and the nation split. And now we see Jeremiah. We went through Jeremiah here, didn't we? And the story of Jeremiah is quite sad because he, he calls people to repentance, but they don't respond. And at the end, he sees the beautiful city of Jerusalem, that city where God dwelled, where his temple was, completely destroyed. The judgment of God came. They wouldn't repent. God even told them, go to Babylon, surrender, and you will live. They wouldn't. And God said, okay, Babylon's coming. And they destroy the city. They destroy the temple. And he exiled uh, all the Jews except for a few, the poor, the peasants, the farmers that stay there. And we're going to find that in the book of Lamentations. So let's turn to Lamentations very quickly before uh, we get into Jerusalem. I promise that although we start in Lamentations, and it's a very sorrowful book, we're going to end up in a very joyful spirit at the end, I promise. Lamentation, the book of Lamentation. Lamentation, it's right after Jeremiah, written by him. And it's basically the, uh, the aftermath of this situation. Babylon has come, they destroy the temple. And Jeremiah, as it were, he's looking to what happened. He's looking back at what he told them and how they wouldn't listen. But he doesn't go around and say, I told you so, I told you so. He laments over this beautiful city that is no longer available to be inhabited. Uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Is it nothing to you? Uh, is it nothing at all to you who pass this way? Look and see if there's any pain like my pain, which was severely dealt out to me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Just to get a taste for it. Jeremiah is saying, you know, the hard thing to do, the hard thing to remember, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar that did all this. It wasn't, you know, the Babylonians who inflicted pain. Yes, it was true, it was them, but it was the Lord who afflicted us. It was the Lord who had come and warned us and warned us and warned us, and we wouldn't listen. And, of course, he's embodying the, uh, the, the, the feelings of Jerusalem. This is verse 12. It's like Jerusalem speaking. Have you ever seen a pain like my pain? I guess it's been turned into a song, and it is true, um, which was severely dealt out to me. Well, it is a very pathetic book, and pathetic in, a good, in, in, in the right word. You know what the word pathetic means? It means full of pity, full of pity, uh, a book that is full of um, uh, pity, and empathy and sympathy over Jerusalem. It has a very interesting structure. We're not going to get too much into it, uh, although I'm tempted. Uh, Lamentation has five chapters, and all the five chapters have, are related to each other. Two of the uh, four of the chapters have 22 verses on it. Chapter 1, chapter 2, 22 verses. Chapter 4, chapter 5 has 22 verses. Chapter 3, which is the big one, has 66 verses. Was if you are pretty good at math, you realize it is 22 times 3. So it's, it's basically seven sets of 22 verses, right? One, two, then three in chapter 3, then four. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, so that's five. And then six and seven uh, on the subsequent chapters. So there's seven sets of 22 verses, um, although chapter 3 has 66 of them, has three of those 22 verses. And each one of the verses begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, then the second letter, then the third letter. It's an acrostic. It's an acrostic. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So every verse begins with, let's say, Aleph, then Bet, right? And then so forth and so on until you finish the 22 verses, which correspond to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But chapter 3 has 66 verses, so it does it three times. Quite interesting verse, which means that what does that mean? Interesting? Yes. But what it means is it was actually put together. It was, it was a, po it's a poem that's put together. Somebody actually sat down and worked all this out, inspired by the Spirit, and structured in a way that we would understand that it's not just some haphazard idea. Somebody's really reflecting with deep, deep com uh, uh, compassion over what happened to Israel. And Jeremiah did it. Jeremiah prophesied. And one of the things that Jeremiah did was the fact that he called on people to repent, but they wouldn't. And he laments, hence the word lamentation. He laments over that. 
Because what God wanted to do, this is found in a previous prophet, the book of Isaiah. What Isaiah wanted to do, what the Lord wanted to do was to comfort them. Comfort, comfort my people Israel. Chapter 40, verse 1, uh, which begins, by the way, in Isaiah, the great prophecy of Jesus is coming. Chapter 40 begins the great comfort of God's people. Why? Because although the people sinned and turned away from him, God had a plan to comfort them through the Messiah. And so therefore we have the prophecy of John the Baptist. He is the forerunner. He is the voice crying in the wilderness. That's found in Isaiah chapter 40. But the first verses in chapter 40 is, Comfort, comfort my people Israel, for her sin has been found, but God is going to comfort her. How is he going to do that? Well, he's going to bring the Messiah. He's going to bring someone who's going to comfort them in a very deep way. But let's turn to real quick to chapter 3 of Lamentation. Because as you get to the middle of the book, let's kind of look at verse 1. As you see the middle of the book, right? Chapter 3 is the middle of the book. We find very deep feelings for what happened. Again, it is moving from deep emotion, deep feeling. It's a poem. It's a, it's a lamentation, you would say, more than a poem. I am the man who sees the affliction, verse 1, because of the rod of his wrath. It's like Israel felt the anger of the Lord and the fierceness of his wrath. But it wasn't quite the day of the Lord, although it's symbolic to what God is going to judge, not just Israel, but the world. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not light. Jump down to verse 17. My soul has been rejected from peace. I've forgotten happiness. So I say my strength has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wondering, the warm, warm wood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. That sounds so depressing. And it is. It is the most depressing book in the Bible. Except right around this point, it switches. It flips. In the lamentation of, Je of Jeremiah, at this point, it changes moods. Look at verse 21. Then I recall, this is what I recall to my mind. And therefore, I have, I have hope. How can you go from extreme, extreme desolation and depression to absolutely elation of hope? Did something change? No, he's still looking at Jerusalem. He's still reminded of what happened. Nothing changed. Circumstances didn't change. Verse 22, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ends. His compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Isn't that wonderful? In the middle of the most depressing book of the Bible, it's the most amazing comforting book or comforting verses in all the Bible. Meaning that as God gives us a very deep, somber book, he also gives us the most amazing verse you can ever imagine. People have clung to these verses and their difficulties and their hardships. But it was given originally to a people who were suffering a devastating loss. Verse 23, they are new every morning. The word new is fresh. They are renewed every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, the, that the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Circumstances didn't change, but what changed was his mind. He remembered the Lord. He remembered that the Lord is good. And this is the exact middle of the book, by the way, if you counted all the verses, the exact middle. And then once you move that, it goes back into, you know, you don't want to hear that, but it goes back into a depressing mood again. So it's like you got this book ends of depression and difficulty, but right in the middle is the, the, the heart of the book. It is the most uplifting verses you could ever find in all the Bible. It's to remember that in the most difficult times, God is there, his promises are there, and he's faithful, and his faithfulness will prevail no matter how deep and how hard things have become. And maybe people need to hear that today because God has promised that after 70 years in Babylon, he would bring them back. And this is what got Daniel so excited because Daniel knew these prophecies of Jeremiah and he began to pray and he began to believe the faithfulness of God and God gave them visions. God gave him uh, uh, visions and prophecies of the Messiah that would be to come. And he actually says, we talked about that last week, that the Messiah would come before the second temple 
would be destroyed. So if we were going to look for the Messiah to come to Israel, he would have to come before 70 AD because that's when the second temple was destroyed. But we'll get to that at the end. So we finished last week with this idea. Jerusalem's in trouble. The city of God, the great faithfulness of God is given to his people. But what about Jerusalem? Is it over? Well, no, because once we turn to the New Testament, right? and you don't have to turn this, but in Luke chapter 2, we find the comfort of Israel has come. And in Luke chapter 2, we find a story, fascinating story. It's a story of the nativity, right? Most people just talk about the shepherds and, uh, and, the, uh, and the wise men coming. And that's not so good. But what about when they take Jesus to the temple? Uh, it would have happened before the Magi came. And they take Jesus to the temple too because he's the firstborn of Mary. And he take him up to be offered to the Lord because remember, the firstborn is offered to the Lord. It's, it's, it's the Lord. So the firstborn belongs to the Lord in Israel. And they offer him to the Lord and there's, a, there's that, that, that ritual, the, the, the shekel, the half shekel for the firstborn. They have to offer a sacrifice because of the firstborn. And when Jesus, being a baby, is taken into the temple. Two people see him. Two old people. One his name was Simeon, and the other one name was Anna. And Anna uh, was a widow, and Simeon was a man that was waiting for the coming of the Lord. And they both look at Jesus, and they both say at different times that he is the hope for the Gentiles, and he is the glory of Israel. He's the glory of his people, Israel. An amazing event. The Messiah has come in the form of a baby. Couldn't imagine. It actually says that Simeon was received the prophecy that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And once he saw him, he said, Lord, your servant can go in peace. I've seen the glory of Israel. I've seen who he is. And may this baby be a blessing to everybody. And Jesus, of course, was an observant Jew. He was, he was a Jew of a real Jew. He, he went to the feast. He went to the temple. And in fact, that we read John's gospel. We're reading it during the Sundays and we're studying it on Sundays that the whole aspect of John is Jesus going to the feast. He keeps going to Jerusalem, keeps going and he keeps leaving. He keeps going and he keeps leaving. So if you follow John, one way of following John is how many times does Jesus go to Jerusalem? A lot, quite a bit. And every time he goes, there's a feast. So one conclusion you can make is Jesus was a very observant Jew. He would go to the feast. He would go to what was required under the Moses under Moses law. And so, uh, by the way, he was accused one time of breaking the Sabbath law. Remember, he's, he had his disciples go through the fields, and he was breaking. How can you have them do that? And Jesus says, because um, one greater than the temple is here. It, you know, simply said. <laughs> uh, Jesus was saying, well, my disciples doing my will is more important than the priest doing the will uh, of the priest in the temple. Remember, because the priesthood was corrupted. They were doing their own thing in the temple. And Jesus says, no, the temple is it's one greater than the temple is here. And the glory of God was within him. The glory of God was within him. And so he was the dwelling place of God. He was the dwelling place of God. In fact, if you were going to look at the temple and you would say, well, this magnificent building, yes, it looked magnificent. Then you look at a man a Jewish carpenter from Galilee, and you would say, well, the temple is magnificent, but the real temple was Jesus. The real temple was God. The real temple was among them. In fact, we're told that. Let's turn to the New Testament now. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, the great story of the transfiguration. Can't get enough of this story. It's an amazing story. Chapter 17 of Matthew. Just to show you how the glory of God was within him. Because remember, remember the glory of God was within the temple and the priest couldn't minister because the glory, the Shekinah glory of God would come into the temple. Well, that Shekinah glory, that glory of God was in Jesus all the time. The only thing that kept you from seeing it was his human veil, his human flesh. But there was one occasion where the glory of God just poured out from his body and you can literally see what was inside Jesus. Chapter 17, verse 1. Of Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took up Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led him up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah talked to them, appeared to them, talking with Jesus. And Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, 
I will make three tabernacles, three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud, remember the cloud that came over the temple? It came over Jesus. Uh, overshadowed them, and behold, a voice, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The glory of God was in Jesus. And there's one, this one occasion, it's the only occasion that the disciples saw who he really is inside of the human body was the glory of God, and it overwhelmed them. In fact, they were frightened. Moses and Elijah appear, a whole story. I won't get into it today. Uh, rabbit trails, right? But he was the temple of the living God, right in the midst of them. And he was walking, he was healing, he was ministering. It was like a mobile temple. It was like the tabernacle, right? Which is exactly what John calls him, right? The word became flesh and he dwelt among us. He would have been tabernacle among us. And just like they took the tabernacle all through the wilderness, Jesus was the tabernacle of God, the temple of God, walking all through Galilee and Jerusalem, fulfilling the will of God. All right. One other, one other one. When Jesus was fulfilling the will of God, he went to the temple. In this particular occasion, let's turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, just a few chapters over. Um, he fulfilled something that we call Palm Sunday. But it's much more than just a Palm Sunday. It was when the Messiah was supposed to show up to Jerusalem as the king. Fascinating, isn't it? You thought they would be expecting the king to come. Uh, one greater than the temple, the brightness of his glory inside of him. How could they have missed it? Chapter 21, verse 1. Now they approached Jerusalem, had come to Bethphage, Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite to you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied there with a colt um, with, with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, uh, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. Immediately they will be sent. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. This is Zechariah 9.9. 9. Say to the daughter of Zion in Jerusalem, Behold, your king is coming, gentle and humble, uh, mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a, of a beast of burden. And the disciples went out and just and did as exactly what Jesus instructed and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the road. Others were cutting branches from trees and spreading them on the road. John tells us they were palm branches. And the crowds began to go in ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when they entered the city, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And we'll stop right there. They were quoting the Psalms. They were quoting the, what they call the, the Hallel Psalms. Uh, Psalm 118. There were several of them, but that's one of them. Uh, Hosanna, that means save us. Now, Hosanna, we think of Hosanna as salvation going to heaven, and we sing songs like that, and, and that's okay. Uh, the words certainly can have that connotation, but it literally means save us, deliver us now. Deliver us now as a means of deliverance from somebody who's oppressing you. Hosanna. Who was oppressing them? It was the Romans, obviously. And deliver us from the Romans is what they were saying. Deliver us from... This horrible disaster that has happened to the nation. Remember this disaster, right? They've never been a nation since. They've never, been, they've never truly been free. So they were waiting for Jesus or the Messiah to come and set them free. Restore Israel. Bring the kingdom back. And the people thought that Jesus was going to come and do that. They literally thought that uh, Zechariah's prophecies, which happened to be right there, were going to come about not only that one, but all the other ones meaning that he would be the king. He would be sitting on his throne. He would lift up Israel. Israel would be the, the main city among the nations. But actually, Jesus didn't do what they expected him to do. We talked about that in our, uh, our, our Palm Sunday service, right? Uh, Jesus actually wept over the city. After this happened, he wept over. And it, it puzzles a lot of people, and it should puzzle you. Uh, go to Luke, Luke 19. Uh, it puzzles people because you would think that Man, they're waiting for Jesus. Why didn't just why didn't they accept him? Because they were looking for another kind of Jesus, another kind of Messiah. Not the Messiah who he really is, but the Messiah who they thought or whom they wanted him to be. 
You're in Luke 19. Look at verse 41. And when he approached Jerusalem, same, same, same situation, going down Jerusalem, Palm Sunday. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and he began to weep. He wept over it. Remember Jeremiah wept over Jerusalem as well? He was the weeping prophet. Same thing. If you had known in this day even the things which make for peace, but now they have hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw a barricade against you and surround you, and you'll be on every side. And they'll level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus weeps over the city because, I know they were excited. They were excited. Uh, they said the right things, but not at the right time. Hosanna, save us now. Well, not from the Romans. They should have been saying, save us from our sins. Save us from us. Save us from not the Romans, but our own slavery, which is sin. And their expectations was to make him king. But Jesus was not about to be king yet. He had to go to the cross. Remember, few people understood this. Few people understood that he was the Messiah. Few people understood he was going to go and die. Uh, remember just, uh, just before the, the, the cross, they had the story of the woman who breaks the alabaster flask and perfumed the whole perfume in the house and, and put the oil on his feet and washed his feet with her hair and her tears. And then Jesus says, she's done this for my burial. Nobody else thought that he was going to die. Everybody, you know, as soon as Jesus said he was going to die, people would be like, no, Jesus, you're not going to die. The disciples said that. You're not going to die. Stop talking like that. And he had to correct them every time. No, I'm going to die. I'm going to go and give my life for the life of many, for, 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 the, for the sins of many, and I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be killed by the Romans. But nobody wanted to hear that. Everybody just wanted to hear Jesus be king, and nobody wanted to hear that the fact that he had to give his life for many. He had to die for our sins, and Jesus wanted to lead his people into righteousness, but they weren't interested in righteousness. They were interested in a, uh, just a superficial salvation. Just make my problems go away. Don't we do that to him? Jesus, just make my problems go away. If my problems go away, I'll be happy. And Jesus is it's not about to do that. Jesus is about to deal with us and our sin because ultimately what leads us to our unhappiness and leads us to our difficulties, it's always us. It's always the internal relationship with God that's not right. And he wants to get that straightened out. So as he gets to, continue in Luke, look at verse 45, um, he had two ways to go when he enters into Jerusalem. You could either go right or go left. To the right is the Romans, Fortress Antonius, so all the Roman garrison were. To the left is the temple. So which way is Jesus going to go? Well, verse 45. Jesus entered the temple, and he drove out those who were selling, the money changers, and saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So he went left instead of right. Nobody expected that. He thought he, they were going to get rid of the Romans. He was going to get rid of the Romans. No, he got rid of the religious leaders and the hypocrites and the people that were making the house of the king uh, a place of merchandise, a place where it was supposed to be the palace for the king. Remember the temple was supposed to be like a picture of heaven? It was a picture of heaven where the throne of God is. That's what the temple was like. The Holy of Holies was the, the temple of God, was the center of all the universe. And the picture of that was the temple on earth. Well, they were making that a den of thieves. His father's house was a den of thieves. A few, just the next chapter over, after he cleansed the temple, in chapter 20, Jesus gives this parable. I'm not going to read it just for the sake of time, but you can read it in chapter 20, verse 9. Jesus gives a parable, and it's called the parable of the vineyard. Now, before you would say, wow, Jesus taught so many interesting new things. Jesus did not teach an interesting new thing in a sense of, People knew this. People already knew this because Isaiah chapter 5 tells us the parable of the vineyard. It would have been a, 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 just a deeper understanding. The clearest understanding is what Jesus was given. He takes a parable that was understood in the Old Testament, puts it in light of who he is in the New Testament, and it makes perfect sense. What's the parable about? Well, the parable says that there was a vineyard owner, and he had rented it out to the, uh, to, to the workers, people that were working in the vineyard. The workers. And after a while, Jesus sent, uh, uh, the owner, let's just say, sent one of his slaves to collect some of the fruit from the vineyard. This is the parable. Well, the workers of the vineyard said, well, we're not going to give you any of our produce. And they began to kill and they began to stone those who were sent in the name of the 
vineyard owner. And then finally, the vineyard owner says, well, they're not going to listen to my servant, so I'm going to send my son. And he sends the son of the, the, the vineyard owner. His son goes to the workers. And then the workers say, oh, this is the son. In fact, they actually use the word heir. This is the heir. And they killed him. And the question at the end, Jesus says, well, what would you think the vineyard owner is going to do to those who killed his son? And, uh, of course, they understood. The, the, the religious leaders absolutely knew what he was talking about. Um, I'll improve it. Look at verse 16, chapter 20, verse 16. After, this, after he tells them the parable, he will come and destroy the vine growers, the workers, and will give a vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, may it never be. The Pharisees understood exactly what Jesus was saying. The disciples didn't, but the religious leaders did. In fact, this is true of the New Testament. Every time Jesus gave a teaching, the disciples are going like, we have no idea what he's saying. And all we have to do is look at what the Pharisees say, and you know the Pharisees understood. So we have a lot to thank the Pharisees for because they made it clear, the teaching of Jesus, they made it clear because then Jesus explains it to the disciples what it meant. And so this parable goes quite well with the fact of what they did. Because look at verse 17. Then Jesus looked at them and said, What then is that is written? It's from the Psalms. The stone which the builders rejected then became the chief cornerstone, Psalm 118, the same psalm that they were singing a few days before, or just before this event. Psalm 118 says that the Messiah would come and he would be rejected like a stone that the builders rejected. So uh, God is laying a new foundation. It's Jesus. And they rejected him. And then the chapter goes on about, you know, the, the, the questions about taxes and the resurrection and all these other things. Uh, but the, and, and remember the story of the widow's mite? There's a widow, and she gives two mites, like a penny. And everyone else is giving a lot of money and making it a big hoopla about it. And she does it very quietly, sacrificially. And Jesus said, well, she gave more. She's more important in the kingdom than these religious leaders. And they can't believe it. It's absolutely can't believe it. So, so this tension, by the way. This contention between the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and Jesus, it all goes back to the Old Testament. So I want to turn back to the book of Zechariah. Turn with me to Zechariah, because Zechariah foretold this. I guess we're going to be in Zechariah for a little bit. Uh, chapter 11, Zechariah foretold this tension. In the first three verses of Zechariah 11, it's a, 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 a metaphorical description of what's going to happen to Jerusalem. The temple will be destroyed. Uh, verse 4, thus says the Lord my God, pasture the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them slay them, and they go unpunished. Each of those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord, for have become rich. And their own shepherds have no compassion on the sheep. This whole chapter 11 is about shepherds. And God's going to use this idea of shepherds to make you understand who he is and what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders were like. It was like God is contending with the shepherds of Israel. And he's saying to them, I'm going to have compassion on them because you haven't. You leaders of Israel, you shepherds of Israel, you who will be taking care of the flock, verse 5 says, all you do is take care of yourself. All you do is say, hey, praise the Lord, I'm rich. And they were very wealthy, by the way. Pharisees were very wealthy. In fact, we're told that in the New Testament, they laughed at Jesus because they were rich and Jesus wasn't. I'm trying to find that verse, right? It's, it's an interesting story. Jesus was talking about money and the dangers of it if you're not wise and you're not careful. And the Pharisees were laughing at him because they had become wealthy and they had become rich at the expense of who? The people, the sheep. Verse 6, for I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. I'm going to cause, I will cause them to fall, each into his own, another's power and another's power of his king, and they will strike the land, and I will not deliver them for their, uh, from their power. Verse 7, so I pasture the flock, doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock. And I took myself two staffs, the one called favor and the other one called union. So I pasture the flock. It got to the point where God says, I'm going to have to do it. I send shepherds to take care of the sheep. They won't do it. 
So the Lord says, I will have compassion on them, and I will do it. I will do it in such a way that will bring the sheep back in line with my will. Look at verse 8. Then I annihilated the three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them, and their soul also was weary of me. What are these three that he's talking about? Well, I believe they were the, 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 the leading religious groups in Israel at the time. You had the Sadducees, which control basically the chief priest. You had the scribes, the men of the law. And you had, of course, the elders, the religious group, the, the, the high and lofty ones, the Pharisees. And they thought they were in possession of Israel. They thought they were the shepherds of Israel. And so God appointed them to rule and have authority over the sheep. And even though God's king was coming, chapter 9 of Zechariah, right, just a few chapters before, uh, now the whole thing changes. The king is here, and now God's going to deal with the shepherds. And it says, I got rid of the three shepherds <laughs> that were evil against my people. Those who thought they had authority over Israel, and I got rid of them. And I got rid of their, their, um, their power, and I got rid of their city. Just like in Jeremiah, God rid of their city. God was going to bring judgment upon Jerusalem. But look at verse 12. I said to them, it is good in your sight. If it's good in your sight, give me my wages. If not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, talking to the shepherd, the good shepherd, throw it to the potter magnificent, at that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took 30 shekels of silver and threw them into the potter in the house of the Lord. What is that? Well, it's the prophecy of what Jesus would be betrayed by. He would be betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. By who? The shepherds of Israel. They weighed out 30 shekels of silver, 30 pieces of silver, which was, of course, if you know the book of Exodus and the law, it was the price you would pay for a slave who died in an accident, gored by an ox. So if, if you lost a slave, an accident, and he died, you would have to give 30 pieces of silver to the owner of that slave because it was an accident. A slave wasn't worth much, but you still had to pay for it. So what they really did, if you think about it in, in, in the Bible thinking, Jesus was, was a nothing for them. Jesus was like a slave to them. And 30 pieces of silver is nothing. And that's what they gave Judas. And so Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Where did we find it first? Zechariah told us what it was like. They will, and then it says that they, were, they will buy out a field, uh, throw it into the potter, that magnificent price at which it was valued to them. So I took 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Well, the New Testament tells us that they took the money from that Judas didn't want. He threw it into the temple. And they said, well, we can't use it anymore because it's blood money. You know, they, they were so meticulous about the law. They said, well, it's not allowed. We can't use the money now because the law says can't use it to, buy, to, to give it to the Lord. So we have to do something else with it. Now, they weren't concerned about killing Jesus. They were so concerned about, you know, not breaking the law, right? So they said, well, we'll just go buy a potter's field. And they bought a field that belonged to a potter says the New Testament, right, is exactly what the book of Zechariah talks about, right? The money that was used to betray Jesus ended up buying a potter's field, believe it or not. And so there's a bit of a divine irony here. Look what it says here in verse, uh, um, in verse 12. Um, sorry, verse 13. Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price. Well, that magnificent price was the price of the incarnate Lord. Their own Lord was going to be sold by them, they were going to be betrayed by, their own, by his own people. And they were going to buy a potter's field with it. There's a whole story about, you know, there's a whole different story we won't get into. The book of Acts tells us a little bit more that Judas hung himself, right? Judas hung himself, and, and it was called the field of blood. It was the place that was called the field of blood. But anyway, long story. Won't get into it too much. It's, it's very fascinating, chapter 11 of Zechariah. In fact, even at the end of Zechariah, uh, chapter 11, it tells us that there's going to be a worthless shepherd that's going to come. And he's not going to take care of the sheep. He's not going to be very kind to the sheep. And God is going to allow him to come. And he's going to make, uh, do whatever he wants to the sheep of Israel. 
This is, of course, speaking of all the ungodly rulers that have come to Israel. And even after Jesus died, the Romans came, and the Romans had, had no no care for Israel. And, and I believe ultimately this is a, uh, it's, it's going to be Antichrist who's going to come like a shepherd through the false prophet and not care for Israel at all. But anyway, let's continue. Because Jesus said something interesting. Turn, look, at, look at Matthew 23. You don't have to turn to there if you don't. I have it up there. But Jesus said at the end of the, the story of the, uh, um, the triumphal entry that after he confronts the religious leaders, he weeps over the city and he says, Jerusalem, I often wanted to gather you like a hen gathers his chicks. I wanted to protect you. I wanted to keep you from all this harm, but you were not willing. So now your house, your city is going to left to you desolate. The Romans are going to come. But I tell you what, you're going to see me again. This is a prophecy. A real prophecy. Not like the one the world gives us, right? A real prophecy. And it says, you'll see me again when you say this. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118 again. The triumphal entry. And oftentimes people say, well, isn't that what they said? And you would be right. That is what they said. But that's not what they meant. It's different, isn't it? People meet, say a lot of things in church, but they don't really mean them. Jesus is saying, when you're ready, when you mean it, when you realize who I am, then you're going to see me again. The people in Jerusalem will see Jesus again. That's what he promised. When? When they're desperate. See, when, when we're desperate, we really seek the Lord, isn't it? A friend of mine, I think it was Brother Rick, reminded me you know, of, a, of a great saying. You know, God doesn't answer prayers. He answers desperate prayers. So true, isn't it? You ever been desperate to ask God for something? You beg God to save you? Yeah, that's how, that's how the whole thing began, didn't it? You beg God to save you. You were desperate. Well, if you remain desperate, God answers your prayers. Just the fact that we're not desperate. Israel will be desperate one time. And they will call on Jesus, and he will come. He will come for them. This is his, this is his coming. This is his second coming. And it, it's interesting because we, we move from the first coming to the second coming, right? And if you're in Zechariah, you didn't move there. Look at chapter 12 of Zechariah because it is all about the second coming. It's all about the second coming. We move from the first to the second in a matter of verses. Zechariah chapter 12. By the way, isn't it, uh, wouldn't it be nice if, uh, if the prophet said, well, this is his first coming, you know, this prophecy is for his first, this prophecy is for his second, and this is, goes back to the first and goes back to the second. It's not like that, right? It would be nice if we had those, but that's not how the Bible was put together. Sometimes you read a verse and you're like, is he talking about the first or the second, right? And then you read a verse, you read the next verse, and it's about the second, and you go back to the first. Don't feel bad. <laughs> we all struggle with it. In fact, the prophets struggle with that. Peter tells us they, they desire to look into the things that they wrote. They couldn't understand them. And so they desired to look further into the things that they, because they, they wrote mysteries that they themselves did not understood. This is how, you know, it's, it's, it's infallible and it's inspired word of God. Here we have, you know, the prophets writing mysteries and they're going like, what does this mean? <laughs> and yet it was the very things that they were hopeful. They, they were hopeful for the Messiah to come. But within the same verses, they would write about his first coming and his second. But you couldn't tell at that time. Because it's all written together. Nobody, nobody thought about one Messiah, two comings. They just thought it was one. one. One Messiah, one coming. Even John the Baptist asked, are you the one? Because he didn't understand why, why Jesus wasn't laying the ax at the root of the tree. Why wasn't he burning up the dross? Why wasn't he judging Israel? No, he came to, sa to save and bring salvation. But he wasn't ready. So anyway, Zechariah chapter 12. Look at verse 8. This is all about Jerusalem. It's surrounded and it's ready to be taken over by the nations. The battle of Armageddon. We jump right into the end, even future for us. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, we were just there in the, uh, the triumphal entry. And then Zechariah springs us all the way, even future for us, to the battle of Armageddon. Jerusalem is surrounded. Judea is surrounded. It looks like it's over. Verse 8. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord. And in that day, I will set to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. God is not happy with the nations. 
They have destroyed his people. They're ready to destroy his people in a way that's never done before. The Antichrist has been in power, and Jerusalem's about to come down. It's about to fall. But then the Lord is going to defend Jerusalem. But God is interested in much more than just defending Jerusalem. Look at verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications that they will look upon me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as he mourns for his only son and they will weep bitterly for him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Then there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadra Minon in the plains of Megiddo. There will be a great weeping on that day and repentance will be at the heart of it. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. They will know and understand at that moment by the Spirit who Jesus really is. And I think it's at this moment where they would cry out to the Lord and say, Jesus saves us. Hosanna, save us. Literally save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's the remnant who's going to say this. In fact, we're told that the remnant of Israel it's going to be the ones crying out to God because Israel's going to go through a very difficult time. Jerusalem's going to go through a very, very hard things. But God is going to open up their eyes. He's, they're going to see who Jesus is. And jump down to verse 13, verse 1. Uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, In that day a fountain will be open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for cleansing. God is going to open up a fountain for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Their veil is going to be lifted. Just like it says in the New Testament, they have a veil over their eyes. No more that day. The remnant will see. And then in chapter 14, look at chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day is coming, declares the Lord, that the spoil taken will be divided among you. I will gather the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured. The houses will be plundered. The women will be ravished, and half the city will go into exile. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. So it's going back. It's going back to what I told you earlier. Jerusalem will be surrounded. Jerusalem is going to be cut off. The people are not going to be able to stay there too long. The nations is coming against them. Verse 3, then the Lord will fight against the nations as he fights in the day of battle. So we're being retold the same story from a different angle because here what it says in verse 4, in that day, it's the day of the Lord. It's the day where he defends Jerusalem. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem, on the east, and on the Mount of Olives will split in the middle from east to west to a very large valley so that the half of the mountains will be moved toward the north and the other half toward the south. And you will flee by the valley of the mountains, and the valley of the mountains will reach Azel, and you will flee just like in the, uh, before the earthquake in the day of Uzziah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day, this mountain will look like this. It will be split. I've been to the Mount of Olives. You can see Jerusalem right across on the east. And it will be split. Why? Jesus came. He landed in Jerusalem. And it says in verse 9, if you keep looking down, the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that day, the Lord will be the one and his name will be the only one. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a great verse. The Lord will be the king. There will be no, no one else against him. Look at verse 20, chapter, uh, same chapter, 14, verse 20. In that day there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holiness to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Everything will be holy on that day. When Jesus returns and he reigns, everything will be holy. Nothing will be unholy. Why? Because God will, Jesus will get rid of all the unholiness and all the impurities of Israel. And in the New Testament and the Old Testament tells us the same, that this is going to happen. This is going to happen. It will be inscribed on the horse's bells. Can you imagine that? Now, this is true. This is not, this is not to be taken spiritually. Uh, I know this happens a lot. People take it spiritually and they don't really see the magnificent verses. What that means is that ultimately on the earth, the only thing that would be projected onto the world will be holiness to the Lord. It's not like that now. It's actually the opposite. It's unholiness, right? It's unholiness in the rest of the world. But one day, it will not be tolerated. Unholiness will not be tolerated. Sin will not be tolerated. And God is the God of history. He's going to do that for Israel, by the way. He's going to do that for Israel. At the heart of God's history, remember, he's the God of history. At the heart of the history is Israel. At the heart of history is Israel and the Jewish people. 
And people said to them, well, Jew, aren't they Israel's unbelief? Like, don't they persecute Christians sometimes and Messianic believers? Yeah, that's true. They're in unbelief, and they not do everything right. And they're hardened against the Lord. And they're trying to be secular and forgetting who they are. But don't look too far. The church is just the same. Called by the Lord, and we're trying to be secular, just like the world, and we forget who we really are. Well, Israel is the same way. All they had to do is repent and believe, trust in the Lord. Be lukewarm no more. Well, the church has to do the same, right? Now, Jesus said regarding the temple, regarding the temple in which he visited, it was called the second temple, it was called Herod's temple, that there'll be not one stone will be left upon another. He did that in Matthew. He said that in Mark. He said that in Luke. It's interesting. Not one stone will be left upon another. In Luke 21, verse 5, you'll find that verse, but you find it in the other, other Gospels too. You can go to Jerusalem today, and you find the stones that were heaped over by the Romans, and they're thrown onto a street, right? This is uh, what I call the, the, the Wall Street crash, right? The, the Wall Street. The, the walls came down, and they threw the stones over, and it literally did crash. You could find them. Now, the Romans did this. Just as Jesus foretold. It was such an amazing building, this building here, such an amazing building. I've been to the bottom. They take, if you go into Jerusalem, you get into these this tunnels, and you go into the tunnels, and they take you to these tunnels, and then you look up and you realize, wow, it was an amazing building. You realize how low you are, how deep the walls went, and how high they are when you're in the tunnel. I mean, you are, they've taken you so far down that it would, it would have been the place where they actually, the marketplace would have been right there. And you look up and you're like, this wall must have been at least 100 feet tall, just incredible height, just of one building. And there were several buildings around the temple. How big was this thing? It was an amazing sight. AD 70, the Romans came, leveled the place, just like Jesus said. There was a siege of about three years, a siege of about three years, and eventually the Romans came in, broke through the wall, destroyed the city, leveled the temple. The gold melted within the rocks. They had to take the rocks apart, shove them over to get the gold out and fulfilling the very words of Jesus. Not one stone will be left upon another. They literally happened. Then later on, about 60 years later, Jerusalem endured another difficulty. It's called the rebellion or Bar Kokhba. What is that one? Well, a few Christians know about this one, but... Bar Kokhba was a false messiah. They thought he was the messiah. They thought he was going to lead Israel back to being a kingdom. And he was promoted by a false prophet named Rabbi Akiva. So you have a false messiah and a false prophet, just like the Bible says will come, right? And he promoted Bar Kokhba as the messiah. He wasn't. So they finally murdered him. The Romans murdered him. But it, it led to a horrible thing that happened. Jerusalem in the capital, as the capital of Israel, they changed the name. The Romans were so angry at Israel that Hadrian decided he's going to rename the place, and he called it Elia Capitolina. What does that mean? Well, it literally means Elias is his name. Hadrian's that's his family name, because it would have been his city. And Capitolina has to do with the worship of Jupiter. So they brought a statue of Jupiter into the, into the temple. And, well, where the temple used to be, and uh, uh, to the Temple Mount, and they began to worship the pagan gods on the Temple Mount. That's how angry they became. But from that time on, Jerusalem has never been under Israel control. Jerusalem's never been under, Jeru under Israel's control. But there was a prophecy that Jesus said. So a lot of people forget this prophecy. It's found in Luke Jesus said a lot of things. He gave us a lot of signs of his coming. He says there will be earthquakes, there will be famines, there will be persecution, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And of course, every critic of Bible prophecy always says this, so I laugh because they always say it. And they said, well, aren't these always been? Earthquakes, persecution, famines, pestilence, have there always been that? And the answer is Yes. But the Bible doesn't tell you there are going to be new things. As the Bible tells us, they're going to increase in frequency and in intensity, like labor pains upon a woman. If you had babies, you know what that means, right? That the labor pains begin, and then eventually they increase in frequency and intensity until the baby's born. Well, the time of Jesus is going to be like that. They will increase in frequency and intensity. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, and pestilence. But Jesus said a direct prophecy. He said, specifically to concerning Jerusalem... He says, the nations 
They will take, uh, they will lay into captivity, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. How do, what does this mean? It literally means that Jerusalem will be under the control and the authority of the Gentiles until the time that is going to be fulfilled. The time of the Gentiles, the restoration of Israel will be happening when Jerusalem comes back under the control of the Jews. Well, on June 7th, which is almost a couple of weeks, oh, not a couple of weeks, what is that today? It's about a month away. Um, Israel will be remembering June 7th, 1967. What happened on June 7th, 1967? For the first time since this event, there were Jews on the Temple Mount. There were Jews walking around the Temple Mount for the first time in 2,000 years. And the whole city of Jerusalem was controlled by the Jews. Now, there was a general that they had a general named Moshe Dayan, and Moshe Dayan did not believe that it was time for the Jews to have the city of Jerusalem. So he gave back to the United Nations, back under the control of the Arabs. He did not feel that it was time for Jerusalem to be under complete control of, of, of the Jews. Now, they only have half the city. East Jerusalem is Arab or Muslim, and West Jerusalem is of the Jews. But now, something has happened, right? The Jews are now in Jerusalem for the first time. And I've been to the line of demarcation. I've been to what it used to be before 1967 and not what it is now. So the, you, you can see the line, like literally in the city of Jerusalem, you could see what used to be the old city where the, 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 the people would go before 1967, and now Jews are able to live in Jerusalem they can go to the temple, uh, at least the Wailing Wall. They can go to the Temple Mount only on certain occasions. It's a big, big fight over that. But it is no longer trodden under the Gentiles completely. There are Jews now in Jerusalem. Just like Jesus said it would happen. Jesus said that there's a time coming where something's going to be fulfilled. What does this mean? It literally means that we're living in an age where God is about to fulfill many things in Jerusalem. Because one of the signs that Jesus said is the Gentiles will trot down Jerusalem, but not fully, not wholly. It'll change in the times of the Gentiles. The, 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 um, the times of the Gentiles are going to be fulfilled. God is changing things. In 1967, seems like a long time ago. And it is true. It tells you something about the point in time in which we live in. We have reached a critical point in history. The Jews are back in Jerusalem just like Jesus said would happen, that they would have to be there in order to see him, whom they have pierced, and they would have to be there to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Part of the imagination, if you think about it in your mind, that could not have happened 100 years earlier, 200 years earlier, 300 years earlier. It only happened within our lifetime, meaning the last century. And it is interesting that Jesus gave the parable of the fig tree as well, that when you see the tree budding, putting out its leaves, you know summer is near. The fig tree is always a picture of Israel. When you see Israel and its leaves coming out, coming close, you know summer is near. I guess you would say summer would be like the coming of the Lord. When you see Israel budding back, Jesus is not that far. And that's a direct prophecy from Jesus. So Jerusalem is back under the guardianship of, Jerusalem, of the Jews to a degree. Not holy yet. But remember, Jerusalem has been trodden by the Gentiles for a long time. You had the Crusaders with the Pope. You had, uh, this is just a timeline of all the, t all the people that controlled Jerusalem. Uh, the British, right? And during that time, nobody cared for Jerusalem, by the way. Nobody cared for Jerusalem. There was a man named uh, Samuel Clemens. And Samuel Clemens got a job. His first job was a uh, journalist. He begged the guy, his, uh, his editor, he begged them for $1,500 so he can travel all around the Middle East. And he went to Jerusalem. He went to Bethlehem. And he wrote it. You can, you can still read his writings. It's a journal. So it's become a magnificent journal. And he basically wrote that this is the place where Jesus lived. This is the place where he was born. This is Jerusalem. Nobody lives here except for goats and, uh, and shepherds. Uh, well, who was Samuel Clemens? Of course, Mark Twain. He became later known as Mark Twain, a prolific writer uh, in American history. But he wrote about that nobody cared about Jerusalem at the time. It was just swampland, deserts, and only people that lived there were goats. It's funny. Yeah, nobody, nobody cared. 
until 1967, then everybody cared. (laughs) Why? Because now Jerusalem was back in the hands of the Jews. And everybody wants Jerusalem now. The UN, the Pope, the US, Muslims, the whole world wants Jerusalem. Why? Why is it so great? No, it's because it's the city of God. And Satan wants to prevent Jesus from coming. That's the whole thing. And he'll use anybody that he can to get to destroy the people that live in Jerusalem. But Jesus said it won't happen. In fact, the book of Micah uh, said that, you know, for a while, Jerusalem will be like a field that's been plowed. There'll be no one living there. But then he says, in the latter days, then Jerusalem will be a place where people live. And this is found again in the book of Zechariah. By the way, we've been in Zechariah quite a bit today. I feel like doing the book again, but we did it a long time ago. So you can find those studies. But remember, Zechariah wrote after they came back from Babylon. So his prophecies about Jerusalem forward could not have been fulfilled until after. After the exiles came back. So he's looking ahead. He's looking far ahead to Jerusalem coming back. And it says in chapter 2 that the Lord... Right? The Lord has sent me against the nations which plunder, for he touches you, touches the apple of his eye. A beautiful verse. Speaking of Jerusalem, the Lord says that he will deal with the nations that come against Jerusalem. Is it because they've been so good? No, it's because he is so good. And he is so faithful to fulfill the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What about this verse in Zechariah? Same, same chapter, chapter 2. The Lord will inherit as his portion Judah and the Holy Land, and he will again choose Jerusalem. Such a comfort for God's people at the time because they thought that God had forgotten them. Remember, Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon and later on was destroyed by the Romans. But God has not forgotten them. So the question tonight is, if you look like this guy, if you have this question is, what is the future? What is the future of Jerusalem? Jerusalem. It is not going to be peaceful. It is not going to be easy. In fact, the city that means peace, Jerusalem, will not have peace until Jesus comes. In fact, we can look at the prophet Joel. Look at it in your own time. But the prophet Joel foretold that the Holy Spirit will come down upon the church. Joel chapter 2. We call it Pentecost, right? Occurred in Acts 2. And Peter quotes from Joel. The Spirit of the Lord will be poured out upon all mankind. And God's spirit will be poured out on the believers and God will use them to proclaim his name. But in the same chapter, he says, but there is the day of the Lord. And Joel sees cosmic signs in the heavens. And he says, this will happen before the coming of the Lord. This will happen before the day of the Lord. And those cosmic signs are the same signs that will happen in Revelation chapter 6, just before Jesus raptures his church. And those cosmic signs, after those cosmic signs, Joel says this, Then in those days, when you see these things happening, when you see the end of the age, then I will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Amazing. Before the Lord establishes his kingdom, he's going to restore Judah and Jerusalem. And then he says in verse 14, then I will enter into judgment against the nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And the Valley of Jehoshaphat, I've been to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's between Jerusalem, there's a valley, and then the city continues on the other side. It is fascinating because you're standing in the place where the Lord says he will enter into judgment with the nations that have divided his land. The nations that have come against Jerusalem, and he, they divided it. God will come against them. Pretty frightening prophecy, isn't it? And God will utter his voice, not from Paris, not from Washington, D.C., not from the Kremlin, not from the UN. It says the Lord will utter his voice from Jerusalem. He will shout like a lion from Jerusalem, and he will send his blessings to his people Israel. So as we finish, we look at this with fresh eyes, right? Jerusalem is much more than just a city that you visit. It's the city of the great king. The city of the great king will eventually have a king sitting on the throne And that's going to happen when Jesus returns. And he's going to come back to Jerusalem. He's literally coming back to Jerusalem to fulfill the promises to David that there will be a successor of David always on the throne forever. 
There'll always be a, a successor of David, a son of David on his throne. And he will literally rule from Jerusalem. He will rule the nations. Yes, they're in unbelief, but it's not for long before the remnant of Israel begins to believe in the Lord. And by the way, they're believing him now. There's many, many Jews who are coming to faith in Jesus. The natural branches are coming back to the tree. So the unnatural branches, and they make sure they need to stay in the tree. That's what Paul says. Make sure you're not broken off. And there'll be no more curse in in Jerusalem. It says there'll be no more curses. There'll be a city of peace in that day. And Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. But that's not the end of the story. Because, you know, for a thousand years, he's going to rule in Jerusalem. And then he'll put away every rebellion, even Satan. And then he will bring the new Jerusalem. The Jerusalem, which is above, Paul says, is coming down. And in that city, the bride, the church, as a city and as a bride, remember, it's 1,500 miles cube. Fascinating city. It's transparent. It's, it's, almost, it's, it's, it's almost like a fantasy, but it's a biblical fact. 1,500 miles cube. And that's where God's people are going to live. And in the city... The light will be the lamb. There'll be no need for the sun. And the river of life will run through the city. What do you think the river of life is? The living water. It's going to run through the city. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. It's going to be in the city. And God is going to be in the city with the lamb in the center of the city. And God will finish all things. And everything will be righteousness and peace. So God has still more work to do in Jerusalem. It's not over yet. But when you read the prophets, right, a lot of people read the prophets and they just say, I can't make any sense of it. You can only make sense of it when you put them together with the New Testament. When you see what Jesus said about the same city, same city, and nothing's changed. His ancient people are his ancient people, Israel. They're just in unbelief. Well, I guess that doesn't tell you much. that They've always been in unbelief, except for a few times in history. But God is going to bring them back And God is going to make a real city, a real people for his name. But what do you do with Israel today? Well, I can tell you what some people do. They either ignore it. Ah, forget Israel. They explain it away. Ah, who cares, right? It doesn't really matter. It's 2023. It's all about me. Right? Not about Israel. But, um, oh, they make it into a spiritual lesson. Which is, is, you can get spiritual lessons out of Israel, but don't forget It is real history. It is really going to happen. And the story of Abraham is going to come to fruition because God promised all these things to Abraham. Before there was I, before there was you, right? Before, you know, us, the center of the universe, right? God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that his people will live in that land forever. And he's going to make sure that that happens. In the process, yes, and we're so blessed for that process. In the process, he brings the Gentiles closer to himself. And he brings us to the same promises of Abraham. And Paul the Apostle says, if you have the faith of Abraham, you are a child of Abraham today and an heir of all the things Abraham is going to inherit. And God promised Abraham a lot of things. But even more, Paul goes on to say, but if you're in Christ, he's also going to make an heir of of you. Whatever Christ is going to inherit, you're going to inherit. And you know what Christ is going to inherit? The kingdom. You know what you're going to inherit? The kingdom. But it begins in Jerusalem. And then people have always asked me, what's outside the city? What's outside the, the great new Jerusalem? Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, has not entered into the mind of men what God has prepared to those who love him. I don't know what's what's outside the city. It's going to be an amazing city. But it's not heaven in a sense. There's still outside the city. It's heaven. Outside the city, there's still more. What has God prepared to those who love him? Well, you'll find out. Get ready for the new Jerusalem. It's coming. And no one's going to stop God from doing it. It doesn't matter what the UN, no matter who likes it or who doesn't. God is going to bring his kingdom. And it's going to begin in Jerusalem. So get ready for that. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so thankful that you are a faithful God, that the ancient promises you gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
are still going to be there. You have not forgotten them. They're still very much real. And you're going to fulfill them, and you are fulfilling them now. Jerusalem is full of Jews today, just like you said they would. Jerusalem is surrounded by nations, just like you said they would. And Jerusalem is starting to see that there's no one that's going to save them except the Messiah. Lord, I pray for the Jewish people today. I pray that their eyes will be opened, the veil will be lifted, the hearts will be uh, less hard at the promises of Yeshua, their Messiah. And Lord, I pray for the church. I pray that the church will wake up. The church will wake up and minister and comfort God's people, Israel, by taking the gospel to them. As Paul the Apostle said, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Lord, we pray that tonight we would learn so much more about Jerusalem, so much more about God's plan and purposes for Jerusalem. And it involves us. It involves your church, the bride, living together, Jew and Gentile, in one Messiah. And in that day, it won't matter. There'll be no Jew, no Gentile in a sense of salvation. They'll be all in Christ. And Christ will be in us, in us all. And God will be among us and his light, and his lamb, and his spirit. And so, Lord, we thank you and praise you for your promises. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys.